Time for what? Experience in college. Time for reinforcements. Time for liftoff! Where nothing is impossible unless you think it is impossible. It's college, impossible. college. It's impossible. my college scholarship. Yes, mom. College ran by real fast. You hung in with the best college. Touchdown! First time for everything. Well, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Let's do this thing. Genius, let's do this thing! So welcome everyone to the show. We are so privileged today because we have Bob Schaefer here, who's the Director of Public Education at Fair Test. Now, Bob has served um, in this role since, is it 1985? Is that right? That's right. Okay, now you are definitely a busy person because you also are have been a writer at the NBC TV affiliate in Boston. I had done that before Fair Test. Yes, but also you have been at many conferences doing a lot of talks. That's how I learned about you because you've also the author of standardized tests and teacher competence and many other research articles like didn't you on fair tests just post another report on merit tests and uh, merit scholarships as well yes my colleague akil bella was the primary author of that uh, as a fair test report showing that the number of merit scholarships that depend on test scores has declined significantly uh, but the ones that still exist are barriers to diversity and fair access. And how I got to listen to you was at one conference talking about a key case, but I do want to bring back how fair tests started first for our audience who may not be familiar with fair tests. So why did in the eighties did fair tests come involved for the nation regarding college admissions? Well, it was a curious history. In fact, it grew out of a lawsuit about employment testing um, in which an insurance company had found that many of their most capable African-American insurance agents could not pass the state licensing test in Illinois and sued the Educational Testing Service, uh, the company that, that then was the primary manufacturer of the SAT, mm -hmm. um, and won. And the executive of that company was so angered by what he saw as unfairness in relying heavily on standardized tests that he provided some seed money um, to a friend of mine who bought, brought together leaders of national civil rights, education reform, feminist and student groups to talk about what was needed, what needed to be done about standardized testing. And they agree, all agreed that there needed to be an organization focused at on eliminating standardized test barriers to fair access and promoting better forms of assessment. And that's how fair tests was initiated. Yeah. And it seems that because of the pandemic, I mean, even before the pandemic, me being in California, the UCs were talking about going where they are now test free. So right. I remind families a lot that the UCs in Cal States, one of the uh, largest California public systems, were seeing that the tests were holding kids back, holding their admissions office, getting some wonderful candidates. And then uh, it opened up the floodgates for so many colleges and universities. So do, so you must remember, so before the pandemic, how many colleges were test-free? Because there have been some great schools like Bowdoin College who've been test-free for or, or test-optional for a long time. Well, actually, Bowdoin was test-optional before a fair test was even created. Yeah. Um, and it, since 1969. So there are over 50 years of test optional admissions. Uh, prior to the pandemic, in um, or late winter of 2020, there were about 1,100 colleges and universities that did not require all or many applicants to submit test scores. Um, only one was test free. That was Hampshire College in Massachusetts. But many, including you know, schools with global reputations like the University of Chicago and Brandeis and uh, American University and George Washington were test optional before the pandemic. Uh, the, the closing down of test sites because of pan pandemic contagion concerns uh, accelerated the movement. And today we're at about 1920 schools that are not requiring test score of that number about 85 are test free, led by the UC and CSU systems, uh, but with schools in every state, uh, in every type of institution, 
around the country not requiring SAT or ACT scores. For our audience, in case they don't know the difference, because I know we're using a lot of different terms. So test optional, a student could opt to set, submit their SAT or ACT test free. Even if you have a perfect score, they will not view that. Um, but uh, we'll ask a little bit later, but those colleges still will look at AP scores. So there's a lot of discussion in the higher education and in post and secondary schools about, OK, is this a replacement of the SAT on there? So but now uh, since we came back and kids haven't have more access to SAT or ACT, one of your schools that you graduate, MIT, walked away from being test optional. And what are your theories about that? Because it's very interesting conversation when I talked to Caltech, who didn't jump back into taking tests, but MIT was like, no, for our admissions office, we need this to uh, for, for admissions. Yeah, a handful of schools, literally about nine, restored test scores after the pandemic. Uh, most of those were Southern universities, which did it for political and ideological reasons. MIT uh, is a unique case. I've spoken to senior admissions folks there at great length, and they say that in their setting, and they, they don't generalize this, test scores proved useful. They have not pr published that research for independent review, uh, but no other major colleges, no other super selective colleges, either in the Ivy Leagues or places like Stanford or Johns Hopkins have followed suit. So for the vast majority of institutions and the overwhelming number of undergraduate applicants, test optional is the new reality or test free, as in the case of California. As a counselor, big high school in San Francisco, I also work at a nonprofit working with various students in, in the public sector. How the stress relief and then the energy and most importantly, the time students are putting in there, because right now the conversation with some kids is, so should I take the test or not? And I go, what are your talents? What is the thing that you want to spend the time? And I think, you know, all those students that I've worked who have done test prep because they had to or just take the test just in general, they never felt, oh, that was so fulfilling. Oh, I've learned so much from it. Um, you know, I have fortunate enough to have four kids and, you know, one of my kids where I'm like, oh, you know, that may help him. And I just saw him for 10 minutes doing test prep. I'm like, you look miserable. Forget that. Just focus on other things that you are great in. But really, you know, that mindset of where do you want to spend your time is so important. And I think that helps more colleges to find out true talents with kids putting their time on there as well. Well, well said. And, and your views are shared by most college counselors. Um, they have seen I me. Mean, there's lots of problems with the college admissions process and test optional, test free admissions are not a silver bullet that solve all of them. But it takes off, oh, it eliminates one significant barrier and empowers students to decide how they will be evaluated, not arbitrarily requiring you know, how well you fill in bubbles uh, on a three and a half hour test or soon how well you do on a computer test uh, to make that decision. It, you, they can look at you holistically in all your strengths, not just standardized testing. Yeah. And the interesting thing is we still have a lot of parents who are that generation who had to take the test. So they're like, no, 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 no. They're still putting value on the test kids, right? They're first, still adding that value. But based on your guys' research, you're not even seeing, even in your latest one regarding about merit scholarships, that that's not a huge factor at all. Not anymore, but I mean, social change is, is a slow process. And for many parents, taking the SAT or ACT was a standard rite of passage during adolescence. You took, if you wanted to go to college, you took the test. Um, and that's no longer true. And it's going to take a little while for the society to adjust to it. But we've seen, you know, the evidence, the, the majority of students who use the common application are applying test optional. The number of students taking the SAT and ACT, despite vigorous promotion by the test makers, has declined from year to year. Um, and students now know that even if they take it, it doesn't necessarily matter. It's up to them at, at most institutions whether test scores will be considered in the admissions process. 
And that takes a huge burden off them and, and gives them choice in this one aspect of the admissions process. Um, choice is always so important. So help us understand with all your experience and you know being so involved in the network on both sides of the table that some schools like Purdue are going to decide like fall 2024 to requiring the test. Mm -hmm. um, there's more, I would say from my, from what I discovered, more public schools using, you know, the test, making it requirement versus test optional, mm -hmm. even though, I mean, Purdue numbers, for example, have been amazing. Uh, you know, their applicant pool for early action spiked mm -hmm. up, like good luck if you were a regular decision last admission cycle. So what are some of your theories why a a few schools are doing that, especially the public institutions. Yeah, I, I think the fact that they're public, which means that they are controlled not by uh, admissions officers uh, who are make their decisions based on data or college presidents who make their decisions based on mission, but by appointed politicians who make their decisions based on politics and ideology. In each of those cases, um, conservative leaders in the state government, in the case of Georgia, Te uh, Tennessee, Florida, and Purdue, which is a public university in Indiana, right. it has all been politically driven. Um, in Purdue, the faculty um, moved a motion to go test optional and was ignored by the administration in Tennessee, University of Tennessee. Knoxville did its own study and concluded that it should be test optional for the next five years politicians overruled that and said, no, we want to look tough. So we're going to have test scores. Same in Florida, where I, where I live, uh, which never suspended the testing, even during the pandemic. And in Georgia, um, two, three in campuses, Georgia Tech, the University of Georgia, and the State College of Georgia restored test scores. The remainder of the publics do not require them right now. But all, in every case, political decisions not ones based on data, mission, or what's in the best interest of students. No, and then eventually the colleges in our society, because it's unfortunate, because when I have some kids who are adamant, like, and these are students who are high school students taking maybe two or th um, college courses at the same time being high school. Mm -hmm. These are hardworking individuals. They were like, oh, this school requires the test. I'm not, I'm going to take them off my list. Right. And so they're losing some great candidates you know, because there's a lot of messaging that happens to the beautiful teenage mind. And they're becoming wiser that they have, like you mentioned, choices. So that goes into my next question of choices. So a lot of colleges um, have been saying, hey, we're going to do this study. Stanford's one of the of finding out, hey, our test optional kids that came in with no tests and we admitted, how do they do? But I noticed they're waiting on talking about the results after a big decision that's coming up through the Supreme Court. So do you see a parallel connection there um, with this study of the test optional group at a lot of these prestigious colleges and universities nationwide and with the decision of the Supreme Court? Uh, yeah, I think there are two separate factors which are connecting and overlapping in the decision making process. Remember that for many of these school, schools, the first class that was admitted with lots of test optional kids uh, was in the fall of 2021. And so those kids are still in the undergraduate years. If you want to do a, a meaningful study like those that, that Bates or Mount Holyoke um, or uh, Wake Forest did, you want to look at four-year graduation rates, G GPA, graduate school um, attendance, and whatnot. And you don't have the data for that. But on top of that, the pending Supreme Court decision on a, uh, race conscious admission, which no is likely to, the decision on race conscious admissions, is going to have a significant impact on the admissions process. If the court, as expected, uh, limits what can be done in the way of affirmative action or other race conscious policies. Fair test is encouraging schools to accelerate their efforts to de-emphasize standardized tests um, because they are a race linked factor. Test scores relate very strongly to race, to family income and to social class um, and eliminating those factors will help level back the playing field by remaining test optional or 
in the case of California, test free. So I was a college counselor when Proposition 209, when the public universities were no longer allowed mm-hmm. to use um, that part of their admissions process. And I still remember being at Thurgood Marshall High School in San Francisco, a public school here in the city. And the students said, quote, and it was so emotionally impactful. That's why I still remember it because it's in the late 90s, said, so UC Berkeley doesn't want me now. And this is a decision of California voters, not the, you know, the Board of Regents. It wasn't mm-hmm. the college or university. And, you know, I know many people from the California state and UC State who worked so hard about bringing a really eclectic group of wonderful, talented students and those numbers pre Proposition 209 have not really changed. And I know we still need some time because, you know, it's only been test free for so long, but that impact has still trickled down in so many ways. Yes, the experience of what happened in California and the handful of other states that banned affirmative action previously is chilling. Um, and many schools are aware that they're going to have to take new actions to level the playing field and eliminating test score requirements for admissions. And something we haven't talked about, financial aid, yeah. um, is extremely important to allow kids who, with talent uh, to still face a, an opportunity, to still have an opportunity to attend those schools. Like you've mentioned, you know, there has not been that great production. Like everyone's assuming the Supreme Court is going to decide to take away affirmative action. And so I've seen so many articles, colleges like, well, we'll look at what the UC systems have done. I'm like, oh, well, they worked hard, but it wasn't successful numbers that they produced. So where do you think the direction of higher education is going to be, considering with all the studies that have been out there, you know, mm-hmm. since that 2021 test optional class, what's happening with the Supreme Court? And also the same year, financial aid is even changing the new form. The uh, the free application yeah, for federal student aid is changing, which uh, not going to even be ready to October 1st. So where, where do you, where does your crystal ball say? Well, I mean, the, you know, you know, it's going to be a very re- disruptive next couple of years with lots of changes. We view and, and the data show um, that eliminating test score requirements either test-free or ACT, SAT, optional, is one tool in the toolbox to preserve diversity. And we expect more schools to look to what has happened at in California, where, for example, at UC Berkeley, in the first couple of years of test-free admissions, they have seen their most diverse campuses uh, since Prompt 209. Not perfect, but moving in the right direction. And that has been true of most of the other uh, UC campuses that, you know, schools are going to have to take a number of actions. Eliminating test scores is one, an important one. They have to do much more aggressive recruitment um, in under historically underserved communities. They need to look at other aspects of their admissions process to make sure there are not inadvertent or intentional or historical artifacts that are blocking access for some kids. Um, And it's gonna take a lot of effort to um, maintain the diversity that college campuses have shown in recent years. Let alone expand it to reflect coming changes in the US population. Yeah, so do you foresee them looking and putting more weight, like if someone classify themselves as first gen or if they're Pell eligible, which is considered yes. you know low income standards in the federal government? Yes, uh, all those measures um, and and other measures that show how students have overcome adversity and and overperformed uh, what you might expect from that. They those kids have earned the right. Uh, to move up in the system and to attend competitive colleges. And the data from the history of test optional, test free admission is that they will do just fine on competitive college campuses, that their GPAs, graduation rates, et cetera, um, are not significantly different from kids admitted with test scores. No, and it's really important, you know, for the high school counselors or all educators to really inform the kids because, you know, I'm a first gen, but I would not think I was first gen since my older sister went to college. 
And there's so much misinformation that's out there. You know, I remember so some students where um, I was touring at a high school for one of my other kids and the kids didn't even turn in their financial, their FAFSA form, you know, so there's so much more work um, and priority mm-hmm. in education. I-, I was wondering if you could just share a, a last few couple of questions uh, to answer some questions that come out from parents, sure. especially our legacy parents. So, so a lot of times there's a lot of fear for parents like, okay, now my kid's not going to have, it's going to have a harder chance of getting into colleges because now they're going to look at first gen, they're Pell eligible, they're zip code more. What is your response? Because, you know, your program and you have done so much research, not only for the individual, but also for society and how this is beneficial through this process. Well, I mean, legacy seems to be a uh... A historical artifact from the medieval times in which children and historically sons of the wealthy and ro- royalty uh, got a leg up in the process. And but that's anti-American un- and undemocratic. Yes, kids whose parents went to, to schools would have a particular interest in that in attending that school. And they should be treated the same as any other kid. But just because, you know, someone's parents did not attend college or their new immigrants, they should be facing a level playing field with all other students. So it, it's don't have a lot of sympathy for legacy admissions. And, and many schools, including MIT, have never had legacy admissions, and they do just fine without it. No. And then I think people forget, like, as you mentioned, there was 1921 schools that were test optional and there's even more schools than that to choose from. Um, that's one beautiful thing. I tell everyone, you're so lucky in this country because you are defined by your actions. Mm-hmm. And, you know, though you attended a very successful school like MIT, I'm sure you work with other great, brilliant colleagues who've gone to many different colleges. It doesn't have to be just that ten, you know, top 10% admissions. Absolutely. And that's uh, really ber- important. Now, my for my fellow educators, a lot of them thought, are thinking, okay, so now are the college going to put more emphasis on AP exams? Because even the UCs will still honor, you know, any AP scores. What have you been hearing on the sidelines about that? Well, there's a lot of chat about um, at the role of AP and the admissions process, much of it exaggerated. Remember that students who take advanced placement courses in their senior year, those scores aren't even available for the admissions process. They take the test in, in May of their senior year, and the admissions decisions were made in January, <laughs> five months earlier. So they're, they're not relevant. They are relevant for uh, placement and in some places for credit. Uh, we are watching and concerned that there is not a rush into for, of kids, uh, often affluent from affluent backgrounds, of taking AP as uh, sophomores and juniors to get those into the process. Our friends in the admissions world, who I think we think are uh, an, an honest group of people, say that AP scores do not matter much except as a signifier that the student has taken the most uh, challenging courses available in their high school. And that so AP, taking AP is evaluated in the context of what courses a particular school offers and a number of, of highly selective private schools, particularly on the East Coast, don't offer uh, high schools, do not offer AP at all. They offer their own version of honors courses. And then there's the opportunity to, to uh, for dual enrollment and other things that in which students can show their capacity to do college work. That matters. The scores on AP tests per se matter much less in the admissions process. No, it's taking, amazing. Taking challenging courses is what admissions offices want to say. That level of curiosity. I think a lot of everyone wants a simple checkbox, a check 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 does make it black and white it's like well but black and white doesn't make a beautiful classroom a wonderful roommate a great club member someone you want just to hang out on the lawn or the the cafe etc uh, mm-hmm. a great future employee um you know so a lot of times when i ask my students how are you demonstrating your you know your level of curiosity some of them have been you know program oh you have to do this 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 and this um they're like huh 
what are you talking about? I just have practice, I have my classes, I have my tutor. And I'm like, take a moment because that's what the colleges are not looking for robots, right? AI has not taken over yet. AI has not taken over yet, despite what people are thinking. Well said. Yeah. And what other words of wisdom do you have for everyone, um, including the SAT and ACT? You know, like there, there's a lot of different groups involved. SAT, ACT, it's very interesting how they keep changing their websites, um, drawing kids in. Hey, sign up for this so you get a scholarship, etc. To our parents and guardians who are very ch- fearful because, you know, change is always going to happen, but this is a lot of rapid change. And for a kid who's just, I'm just trying to do the best for me and my family. What words of wisdom and just in messages you have for those groups? Well, they're, you know, as you said, they're very different constituencies. The college board, which manufactures the SAT and uh, ACT are businesses. They're selling they're designing and selling products. They're marketing firms. Uh, both have had significant financial reverses in recent years because of the uh, pandemic and fewer kids taking the test. There have been substantial layoffs. You know, they, they're they not necessarily a permanent fi- fixtures in the, the college admissions process. We see them playing a lesser role going forward. And that's why companies like the College Board are moving into other areas. Right now, AP is a much larger uh, business than the SAT is because there's less, fewer colleges requiring the SAT. They're also pushing both ACT and College Board are developing curriculum as a way to plug the hole in their revenues. I think parents are the most important to, to understand that the world has changed since we applied for college. The test is not the be all and end all. Colleges want to know more about applicants than how well they did on Saturday morning or a school day taking a test. And it's much more important that your daughter or son build a a, a, a plausible background uh, that shows colleges that they are c- college ready and interested in learning. And that means finding something that interests your, your child and pursuing it deeply, whether it is academic or community service or religious or whatever, um, and showing the depth of interest and knowledge and performance that colleges want to see. As you said earlier, they don't want robotic test takers. They want well-rounded, interesting people to build uh, first-year classes. So important for our kids to hear that message from great people like you, especially their parents and guardians. Their parents, yes. Yeah, that's the one, I mean, right, that's the number one most important and biggest teacher in their lives. But I think, you know, once kids see that curiosity, once that parent or guardian sees that kid light up doing something that they really appreciate, and then regardless of what happens to the college admissions, you know, they we get a lot happier um, in the long run and for our community. But I just want to thank you so much for fighting the good fight for so many years, opening this door, having such a great website at fairtest.org. Is there anything else you wanted to plug in for our audience as resources for them to use? Well, I mean, fairtest.org has lots of information about colleges and the admissions process, particularly the testing aspect of it. If you really think the tests are important, take a look at that website at fairtest.org test.org and see that 85% of schools no longer require test scores. Um, you can be, uh, your, your child is much more than a score and college admissions offices in the 21st century know that. They will look at that person as a holistic individual and fixating on the test scores is a historic artifact. So I bet your crystal ball does say that number is going to still stay high, not only for admissions, but for scholarships. We have, yes, the number more schools need to eliminate their test scores for scholarships. And we're working with a number in that direction. And we expect we've already seen more than 1500 colleges and universities commit to permanent test optional or test free admission. And the University of California and CSU systems our national leaders in that process. Um, Well, thank you for being so great on there. And then when will the new fall 2024 list come out on your website? Well, our list is updated uh, regularly right now in the the underlying database. We have the 2024 information. We'll show it live when the new common app is released, which is on August 1st. Uh, We'll switch over to 2024. Many schools are still recruiting. There's another thing parents don't understand. 
is that there are hundreds of colleges and universities with empty seats for fall 2023. Many schools whose names you'll recognize. So it, it you know, all is not lost if the child has, has had a number of rejections. There are places that want your student and will provide financial aid in many cases. But on August 1, we'll switch over the site to uh, 2024 test optional and score break. And then you're also on social media on Twitter. So I know yeah. as decisions are coming out um, and yeah. as change keeps on changing, you'll keep us informed. Bob, thank you and to your team for doing the good work for so many. Thank you. And thanks all right. to all the counselors who do the good work. Thank you for listening to SI Counseling Podcast, where we help our students strive to respond courageously to the opportunities and challenges of our time. Mm-hmm.